So of course, thank you, a big thank you to Chazak, and thank you to Kehilat Avodat Hashem. Hashem. What a beautiful name of a shul. Kehilat Avodat Hashem for hosting tonight's shiur, of course, and Olga for opening your home. Uh, it should always be a place of Torah and Kedusha Yehirat Son. Okay, so we just came out of Rosh Chodesh Shvat. We're in the month of Shvat, and we know that Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was about to leave this world, he gathered together all the Jewish people together and he said to them, I want to give you one more shiur. Now, wouldn't it be awesome to go to one last shiur of Moshe Rabbeinu? He gathers them together on Rosh Chodesh Shvat. Everybody is waiting, okay, let's see. And when does the shiur end? On Zayin Adar, a, a more than a month later, when he dies he, and he, his last drasha. It was Sefer Devarim that he gave his last drasha. Started Rosh Chodesh Shvat and ended with his Ptira when he passed from this world. He gave over his whole legacy. And so the rabbis tell us that Rosh Chodesh Shvat and the month of Shvat is when we can reach inside of ourselves and to find the deepest part of Torah and how it's real to us in this world. So I want to start with a true story. There was a... Kolel Avrech. He learned in Kolel. He had a beautiful family and he was getting ready to marry off his daughter. And he had promised a certain amount of money for the dowry and the wedding is getting closer and closer and lo and behold he's unable to come up with the funds. He doesn't know what to do. He tries every different aspect that he can and he can't make it work and he decides that you know what? I'm going to try my luck. I'll book a ticket to America and I'll go, I'll collect, and people hopefully will be generous, will open their hearts, and I'll be able to pay for my daughter's wedding. The Kachava, he books a ticket, and before he leaves to come to America, he goes to the great Gadol Hador who passed away just a few years ago, Reb Aaron Leib Steinemann. He goes to Reb Aaron Leib Steinemann and he tells him, listen, this is the story, this is my situation, and I'm going to America to collect funds. The rabbi strokes his beard and says to him, you will be successful, but I need you to promise me two things. And so this young, this, uh, young father, let's call him uh, Yaakov, Yaakov says, okay, rabbi, sure, what can I promise you? And he says, you are a kolal avrech which means you learn in kolal your whole day. You're sitting and learning Gemara. Just because now you're going to America for a week doesn't mean that you can abandon the Torah. I want you to promise me that your first half of the day, you learn a full morning Seder. So, I mean, he only has a week to collect, but the Gadol Adar is telling him to learn for the first few hours of the day. What's he going to say? He says, yes, I'll do that. And he says, and the second thing, Anytime someone gives you a donation, no matter how small it might be, I want you to say thank you to them and feel as if they gave you the most amazing donation, the biggest donation possible. Okay? And the rabbi tells him, Hatzlacha, you'll be successful, go with bracha. So he's very excited. He got such a good bracha from the Gadol Adar. He's going to go to America. He's a Yid who never left Eretz Yisrael. He barely out of the Dalit Amot of his kolal. And he's going to go to America where it must be everybody is so rich and everybody just hands out thousands and thousands of dollars at the corner. And... He tells his wife, he tells his children, I'm going to go, I'm going to collect, I'm going to make the most beautiful simcha, everything's going to be so geschmack. And he lands in America and he goes to the town that they told him to go to. And of course, it's the reality sets in. You know, people are busy with their own lives. Not everybody is looking to come and to find somebody to give him uh, a donation. He settles in the house that had hosted him and he goes the next morning to the Beit Midrash. Okay, he promised the rabbi he's going to learn. He starts, he opens up his Gemara and he's learning. Comes Chatzot, midday, he closes the Gemara and he begins to start to go on the different streets that they tell him from town to town. Hi, I'm collecting my daughter. I, uh, this is what I do. He's an Amamish, a Tamil Chacham. We're getting a dollar here, five dollars there. Sometimes he gets a few coins. And day after day, he, his whole morale 
is getting sucked up. He doesn't know what's going to be. One day goes by, two days go by, three days go by. It's already the fourth day of his trip. He's barely collected enough money to cover his plane ticket. Forget about collecting to be able to marry off his daughter. He's barely collected the money he needs to cover the expense of his plane ticket. And he's sitting there now on the fourth day of his only one week trip. And he doesn't know what's going to be. And he says, okay, but the rabbi told me I should learn. And he opens up his Gemara and he's thinking, maybe I need to, you know, take a whole day to go and to put more. But the rabbi told me to learn. He opens up his Gemara and he's trying to focus. But the words are blurring in front of him. And all of a sudden he finds himself crying. And somebody notices him and comes over to him and says to him, Reb Yid, what's the matter? Is everything okay? And he says, listen, you know, I came here to collect for my daughter's wedding. I'm only here a short time. I've barely connected, collected enough money to pay my plane ticket. I haven't even gotten anything towards her wedding. And he says to him, listen, why don't you come with me now? I'm going and I'll take you to a really fancy street with very, very generous and very, very wealthy Jews. And you come and you'll collect over there. Hopefully you'll be successful. He looks at his watch and he says, listen, I, I can't. I promise that I'm going to learn until midday every morning. Maybe we can meet after lunch, and he says, listen, I work in the afternoon, but I'll come, I'll pick you up at 8 o'clock tonight, and I'll drop you off on this very fancy street. I want to help you out. Okay. So he, again, he's learning, and he's, he's concentrating, and he gets lost in the sugya and the learning, and he realizes, okay, now it's chatzot. Again, he tries to go collect. He makes dollars here and there comes 8 o'clock at night and this guy picks him up and he says, listen, you're gonna, yeah, you don't understand, it's like the wealthiest block in America. You're going to hopefully be very successful. These are very generous Jews. And he drops him off and he says, good luck. He goes to the first house on the block just to get up the stairs takes him like three, four minutes because it's such a huge property. And he goes up the stairs and he, you know, knocks timidly. Then he realizes nobody's going to listen. He sees, oh, there's somewhere to ring. He rings. He sees his face. He's on video. He's waiting. Oh, he's thinking about him, what he's going to say. And my daughter and this and that. He's already imagining the big donation he's going to get. He rings again. He rings again. Nobody even answers the door. They see already it's some guy from Israel. Nobody wants to deal with that. Okay. He goes to the next house. Again, takes him a few minutes to get to the next house. Such huge properties. Goes up, beautiful house. Rings again. He sees his face on that same thing. Okay, maybe somebody's going to pick up. Nobody answers the door. Not the second house, not the third house. He gets to the fourth house. He's beyond discouraged. He doesn't know what's going to be. He turns up to HaKadosh Baruch and he says, Rebano Shalom, please help me. He rings the bell, his face comes up on the intercom again, and this time somebody answers him and says, yes. And he's shocked that even somebody is answering, and he says, I'm here from Israel, I live in Bnei Brak. I'm marrying off my daughter, Achnasas Kabla, it's a very big mitzvah. The guy says, okay, I'll be down in a minute. You can come in, we'll talk. So he says, okay, somebody's going to answer the door, and it's such a big house, and the guy opens up the door, and he has his paper to show him, hi, how are you? And all of a sudden, from behind, he hears a dog start barking. And the dog is barking, barking, barking. This is a Jew from B'nai Brak. Doesn't have really any experience with dogs except for abject terror. Okay? He hears this dog barking and starting to walk towards the door. You remember the story? Starting to walk towards the door. And he runs for his life. Down all of the stairs and he runs. And this guy is standing there, the Balabite. He's standing there and he's laughing at this Jew from Israel. And he says, what's wrong with you? My dog is the nicest dog you've ever met. Well, you're running like that out of fear. Come, come back. Don't you need something from me? Come, come back. And he picks up the dog and he says, don't worry, I'm going to hold him. So this Jew from B'nai Brak walks back to the door. He doesn't know what to do. His heart is pounding, but he needs, he needs the tzedakah. And he comes and the man says, come in, come in. And he's so scared, but he comes in and the man tells him, come sit. Puts him on a beautiful couch. He's holding the dog. He puts the dog down and he sees the Jew again, goes like this. He says, don't worry. Rexy listens to me. Anything I tell her to do, she does. Rexy, you stay. 
She's not going to move, I tell you. So tell me your story. So this Jew from B'nai Brak says, my daughter, and this and that. He says, what are you learning? He's learning this, that, the other. He says, okay. And the guy reaches into his pocket and pulls out a $5 bill. And he takes the $5 bill, and the man sees a $5 bill. He's like, what? He's going to give me $5? It gets worse. He takes the $5 bill, and he puts it in the mouth of the dog. And then he says, Rexy, go give it to our friend over there. So this guy tenses up. He says, don't worry, I told you she's not going to bite. And the dog comes, and the dog sits right at the feet of this Jew from B'nai Brak with the, <laughs> with the $5 in her mouth. This Jew doesn't even know what is going on over here. He takes the $5, it's soaked in spit. He's humiliated. This guy is making a joke out of him. He takes the $5. He wants to crumple it up and throw it back at this guy. How much can you torture someone? He wants to throw it back at the guy. But then he remembers what the rabbi said. Anyone who gives you anything, thank them from the depths of your heart. So he turns to the guy and he says, I want to thank you so much for the tzedakah. But you know what? I want to thank you even for something more. You helped me to understand a Gemara that I never understood. So the guy, who thought that like, you know, he's going to be angry and everything, he's surprised by this uh, response and he says, oh yeah, well, what did I do? How did I help you? See, so he says, I was literally learning the Gemara this morning. The Gemara says, Al tachnis lebeitecha kelevra. Don't allow a bad dog into your house. And you know what? A lot of people don't bring dogs into their house because of this Gemara. And I always had a question on this Gemara. Why does the Gemara have to say Kelevra, a bad dog? Hello, all dogs are bad. Was there such a thing as a good dog? I'm a Jew from B'nai Brak. I've never seen any dog that's good. He says, but I come here now and I understand the Gemara because there is such a thing as a good dog. And he turns to this man and he says to this man, your dog is a good dog. You know why your dog is a good dog, he tells him? Because you teach your dog the mitzvah of tzedakah. And so now I understand there's such a thing as a good dog. That's why the Gemara says only kelev ra that you can't bring. There is a kelev tov. Thank you so much for your donation and, you know, God bless. And he is ready to turn and to leave. He sees this guy who's sitting there. Let's call him Jack. He sees Jack who's sitting there. All of a sudden gets very emotional and says, wait, 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 wait. Tell me that Devar Torah again. He tells him the Devar Torah again. He says, Eze chidush. I can't believe this chidush you just said. He says, I want you to go. Jack tells Yaakov, thank you. I want you to go. If you cross the street and go two houses down, he tells him the number, I want you to knock at that door. It's the nicest house on our block. Knock on that door and tell him Jack sent you. And tell him Jack wants you to tell him this Devar Torah. Tell him the Devar Torah. Maybe you'll see he might give you a nice donation. Mm -hmm. So this Jew from B'nai Brak, he doesn't know what's going on over here. Okay, thank you for your $5. I'll go across the street, two houses down. I knock on the door. I ring the bell. This time a much older man answers the door and he says, I'm coming. Uh, actually, I'm coming because Jack sent me over here. Who sent you over here? Jack, your neighbor from across the street, two houses down. Jack sent you to my house? Yes, he wanted me to share a Devar Torah with you. Interesting. Okay, please come in. Let me hear your Devar Torah. And he tells him the whole Devar Torah, Kelev Tov, Kelev Ra. And he sees this guy also, this older man also is getting very emotional. And he says, I can't, I can't believe you told this to me. He says to the man, I need you to go back to Jack's house and tell Jack, I want him to come with you, both of you together, come back to my house. <laughs> okay. He goes back to the house with the dog. He rings the bell. His whole body is tense. And he says, I went. I told this to your neighbor. He got very emotional, and he wants you to come with me. We both go over to his house. He says, he wants me to come to his house? He says, yeah. He said, come. Let's go together to his house. He says, he asked. He told you to that I should come to his house? Yes. 
You should come to his house with me. Oh my God, he sees a guy. He goes to the mirror. He's fixing up his hair. He's straightening himself out. And, and they go. They go across the street, two houses down. And they knock on the door. And the older man opens the door. And this Jew from B'nai Brak is just watching. This older man and this younger guy. And there's like a silence between them. And the older man says, come in, Jack. Come in. And he walks in. And all of a sudden, both of them are crying and hugging each other. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And this Jew from B'nai Brak has no idea what's going on. This one is saying, I'm so sorry. It was so foolish of me. No, you were right. No, you were right. How come we did this? We wasted so much time. Finally, the emotions calm down. And they turn to this Jew from B'nai Brak and tell him the story. The older man is Jack's father-in-law. Two years ago, Jack decided he wants a dog. And his father-in-law told him, the Gemara says, you don't bring a dog into your house. Jack, if you bring a dog into my daughter's home, if you bring a dog into your house, you will never be welcome into my house again. And Jack said, who's my father-in-law is going to tell me what to do? And he bought the dog. And for two years, they hadn't spoken with each other. They hadn't come over to the father-in-law's house at all. And he, they turn to this Jew and they say to him, but now you taught us this chidush? How could we have been so foolish? I don't know why, dad, I did that to you. I don't know why, son, I didn't think. And they make shalom. You know, this Jew from B'nai Brak is sitting there. He's so happy he was able to make shalom. They tell him, can you wait here a minute? Sure. They go to the kitchen. They both come back together. And they sit down and they say to him, how much do you need for your daughter's wedding? And he says, I need $18,000. And they look at each other. Each one takes out his checkbook. One of them writes a check 9000 The other one writes a check 9000 And they give it to him. And they say, here, thank you for making shalom between us. And this is the last day of his trip. The next morning he gets up. It's time for him to fly back to Israel. He flies with the whole schum, the whole sum in his pocket. He gets back to Eretz Israel. His family is so happy. He goes to the rabbi and he tells the rabbi everything that happened. And the rabbi tells him, how lucky you are that you sat and learned Torah that morning so you would have something to say about that dumb dog. <laughs> the moral of the story is that everything that we have that brings us success comes from the Torah. Comes from Torah, comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, comes from being loyal to mitzvot. Comes from the chashibos of Torah that we have. To live a life like this, a person has to have bitachon. A person has to have faith that I'm going to do the right thing, even though it seems like from a natural perspective I should be doing something else. I'm going to do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants me to do, and it's going to happen for me. These parshiot that we're reading now of Shemot, the whole story of Yetziat Mitzrayim, our Chachamim tell us that this story of Yetziat Mitzrayim is the basis, foundation of a Jew's faith. And what do we see? That we learn now all the stories about Yetziat Mitzrayim, all of the Makot, everything that's going on, we learn it now, and then we're going to repeat it all again, Pesach time. By Pesach, we're going to repeat all of these stories again. Why? Hashem says, you need a double dose. You need to keep on repeating this idea of emunan bitachon, emunan bitachon. So here is the question, okay? We're so thankful to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Thank you, Ribbono Shalolam, that you took us out of slavery. Thank you that you saved us from Mitzrayim. And we're so thankful to him. And then the famous question, one second, who put us into Mitzrayim? Hashem. Thank you so much, Hashem, that you took me out of Mitzrayim, but you're the one who put me into Mitzrayim. Why did you have to do it in the first place? And that's a question we have to ask ourselves. Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu have to put us into the whole schlep of Mitzrayim? And I want to tell you something. Whenever we talk about Egypt, whenever we talk about we were slaves in Egypt, it was not something that happened, you know, thousands of years ago. Any time in your life that you feel like you're in stress, you feel like you're in a tense place, guess what? Boom, you've just been transported to Mitzrayim. 
Mitzrayim is the word sar, being squeezed. Whenever you're squeezed in your life, you're in Egypt. Hashem will take you out like he did by Egypt. But why did he put you in there in the first place? Why did he put us as slaves in Egypt? And the answer is like this. He wanted to teach us bitachon. He wanted to teach us faith. There are two kinds of faith. There's the faith that we learn in a shiur. We sit, we learn the concepts, we know it in our heads. And then there's the bitachon that we have in our body. We know it. We feel it from our body, from who we are. How do I know that I have a finger? Because I feel it. I don't have to have faith that I have a finger. I know it deeply. So you know there's the famous story of the guy who's sitting in his rabbi's class and the rabbi is giving this unbelievable class about amunah and bitachon and if you believe in Hashem, anything that you believe in Hashem, if you believe in it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu can do it. There's nothing that Hashem can't do. And this guy is listening to his rabbi and he's super inspired. He comes out of the shir and he says, I believe Hashem can do anything. I really believe Hashem can do anything. You know what, I need $100,000 and that's the drawing for the lottery. I'm going to buy a lottery ticket and I believe Hashem is going to make me win that $100,000. And he goes and he buys the ticket and he really believes it. He comes home, he tells his whole family, I'm gonna win, we're going to win the $100,000. His rabbi who gave the lecture hears about his student that he did this. The rabbi comes to his house and the rabbi says, my dear Talmud, my dear student, I'm so impressed with you. You really took the share, you took it to heart. He says, rabbi, you don't understand. I believe it fully. I know Hashem can make me win the lottery ticket. I'm going to win the lottery ticket. The rabbi looks at his student and says to him, I'm so inspired by you. You know what? I tell you. And he takes out a briefcase. And he opens up the briefcase and he has stacks of $100 bills. He says, I have $30,000 in cash right over here. I so believe in your emuna that you have the winning lottery ticket. I'm willing to buy it off of you. Will you sell it to me? So the guy is looking at his lottery ticket, and the guy is looking at $30,000 cash, and he says, you know what, Rabbi, for you, yeah, I'll sell it. <laughs> so the rabbi looks at him and says to him, my dear, my darling student, you have the mind of bitachon, but you don't have it in your body. Because what Meshugana is going to sell $100,000 for $30,000? If you know for sure you have $100,000 tomorrow night, why on earth would you sell it for $30,000? Because you have it in your head, but you don't have it in your body. And so Hashem puts us into Egypt. He puts us into stressful situations so that we could learn it, not just in a shear, but we could learn it from our body, that we're stressed out, and then Hashem comes and saves me, and we can say, wow, I believe in Hashem. He can do anything. And that's why there's a whole idea to say Hashkacha Pratid stories, stories of divine intervention, that Hashem saved me. This happened, that happened. Oh, I needed a green light. I got a green light. Everything is from Hashem. Hashem and to repeat it to ourselves that it shouldn't just be in our minds but that it should be in our bodies that we should have it. One of the biggest challenges when it comes to Amunah and Bitachun is when it hits Parnassah. A person can have all of the Amunah and Hashem is going to take care of this, Hashem is going to take care of that but all of a sudden there's a business deal and you have to be a little bit shady or maybe you have to go like this, you have to go like that and you say, you know what, I'm going to do the deal, don't worry, anyways, all of the proceeds I'm going to give to Tzedakah. Hashem says, I want you to have emunah in me, bitachon in me, in everything, including in parnasa. Parnasa is really made of two words, pre nes, the fruit of a miracle. The way livelihood works, the way making a living works, is Hashem says, I want you to do ishtadlos, I want you to do effort, and then that's going to be the show. I'm going to slip you the money. You think it's your work that's making the money? I'm going to slip you the money in some other capacity. Parnasa is pre 
witness the fruit of a miracle. And Hashem says, I want you to remind yourself of that. Every time you get your paycheck, your paycheck is on time, but I worked this many hours. I want you to remember that it was a miracle that you got this paycheck. It was a miracle that you make money when you make money. And when you need money, it's a miracle that the money comes to you. I was telling this um, to a group of young women and this the girl says to me, you know, I can't believe it. She says, my family has a minhag. I never heard of this minhag. And she says, I don't know anyone else who does this. My family has a minhag on Friday night. We eat an apple. We eat an apple as a sugula for Parnassah. And she said, maybe it's because pre-ness, because it's the fruit of a miracle. Because ladies, you know where all the source of Parnassah, all the source of our financial success, where does it come from? It comes from Shabbat. Shabbat is Mekor Habracha. That's so strange, no? Shabbat is the one day that we don't work. And that's where all our Parnassah comes from. Oh, but it's not so strange. Because Hashem is telling us, it's not your work. You have to do work because you have to look normal in this world. But when you keep Shabbos, when you keep Torah, when you keep the mitzvot, that's what brings your parnasa. That's what brings your success. In order to live a life dedicated to Torah and mitzvot, a Jew has to be solid in her bitachon, has to be solid in her faith in Hashem. Because at the root of all of our, you know, why does a woman have trouble with the mitzvah of tzni'ut? Why does she want to dress in a way that's... A, because a woman has a natural desire to feel attractive in the world. She wants to look pretty. She wants to feel pretty. And she thinks that there are certain outfits that make her look prettier than others. Hold on. How does a woman look pretty? By the perception of the person who's looking at her. Guess what? Hashem controls that perception. If I realized that Hashem could make it, that I should have chen, I should find favor in the eyes of people, the right people who are looking at me, then I have no problem with the tzniut. I have no problem with the, oh, but on Shabbat I want to put on makeup, but how? But Hashem, every time I have a struggle, I have to think about what is it really that I'm struggling with? Hashem, please let those people find that I should find favor in their eyes. I should look pretty for them. Hashem can make anything happen if we believe in it correctly. What was the first of the ten makot? Blood. And so the Nile River turns to blood. You know the famous question, what color was the Nile River? In all the picture books it was red, but most of the Mepharshim hold actually that it was the color of water, and it was only when you drank it that it tasted like blood. Anyhow, the Nile River turns to blood, and what happens as a result of the Nile turning to blood? All of the fish in the water die. Now we know the Jews in, B'nai, the Jews in Mitzrayim, they really, really liked fish. How do we know that? Because when they're in the desert and they're remembering Egypt, they say, oh, hey, we remember the fish of Mitzrayim. It was so delicious. So what happens? The fish die during the first Makkah and the Jewish people look at each other and say, can you believe this? What's going to be? All the fish are dead. What a tragedy. How could this be? We're not going to have anything to eat. But you and me, we know what happens. They're drinking their water. Meanwhile, what's happening to all of the Egyptians? All the water that they have turns to blood. And you know what the Midrash tells us. It wasn't just the water from the Nile. It was any liquid turned to blood. So you have Mr. Egyptian bites into a juicy orange, hoping to get some liquid in his mouth. And what happens? The juice of the orange turns to blood. Every liquid in Egypt that was ingestible was blood for the Egyptians. And they can't believe it. What's going on? So they run to the city where all of the Jews are and they see the Jews are drinking, the Jews are showering, the Jews are cooking. And they say, how could this be? And they grab the water from the Jewish person and they start to drink the water. And what happens? It turns to blood. <laughs> they say, okay, they see the Jew. The Jew is drinking their water. <laughs> The Jew is drinking their water, and they say, Jew, you hold the water, and you put your straw in. Drink. It's water. It's water. And the Egyptian comes and puts his straw at the same time. He says, I'm going to get water now. From the Jewish straw comes water. From the Egyptian straw comes blood. They don't know what to do. How could they survive without water until they realize, if I open my pocket and I pay for the water, then the water stays 
water. And what happens? All of the Egyptians come to the Jewish city and they begin to pay the Jews for water, that they should have each cup of water, each pot of water, however much water. And what happens to the Jewish people that week? They become very, very wealthy. What they thought was so bad, now we're not going to have fish. It turns out that Hashem was preparing for them that they're going to become wealthy from it. And that was the beginning that Hashem was telling them, I want you to believe in me. I want you to trust me. Sometimes things look challenging, but I'm preparing something even better for you. But believe in me. And it becomes part of me, included in me, in who I am. The next plague of frogs, so we know that the frogs, they were so um, excited to do the will of Hashem, that they even jumped into the ovens and they were baked into the bread and the Egyptians had frogs in their bread. And uh, we talk about, wow, the frog says, Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed. The frog is so, such a symbol of Messiah Nefesh. Even the frogs jumped into the ovens. But then in this week's Parsha, in Parshat Bo, when the Jewish people are leaving Egypt, speaking of dogs, good dogs and bad dogs, the dogs were, there were guard dogs all around Egypt. And actually some of the Mepharshim say that there were dogs were, com were controlled by magic from the Egyptians. And that if a Jew would ever try to escape, that the dog would tear the Jew to shreds. And that uh, in some way that this was something that it's, it's some, in, somewhat in Jewish genetics to be scared of dogs, although everything now is changing. But there, that there's, a, there's somewhat of a fear of dogs from the time of Egypt. But there was a massive miracle that happened as the Jews are leaving Egypt. All of the dogs that were there, that they would hear their barking all day long, all of the dogs, the dogs did not bark. The dogs did not menacingly wave their tongues at the Jews. The dogs very quietly allowed the Jews to leave. And the Gemara tells us, as a, as a result of this, we now reward the dogs. If there's ever a trefa, a piece of meat that is not kosher for a Jew to eat, what do we do? The Gemara says you should give it to the dog. Because the dog didn't bark when we left Egypt. So now I want you to pay attention. We have two animals that did amazing things. On the one hand, you have Mr. Frog. And Mr. Frog jumped into a burning oven to glorify the name of Hashem. And then you have Mr. Dog, who doesn't actually do anything. He just doesn't bark when the Jew is leaving. Which animal did something more amazing? The dog. But the dog went against the snake. Ah. So it seems like the frog, <laughs> the frog jumped into a fire. This in Hebrew is called Mesirat Nefesh. When I, I, I sacrifice myself, for Hashem's sake, the dog didn't jump into any fire. What did the dog do? The dog's nature is to bark, but what he did was he held back his nature. And he's the one who gets the reward. And so the rabbis tell us, greater to overcome your nature than to do Mesirat Nefesh. Sometimes we think to ourselves, I'm going to do so much chesed, or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then they tell us, okay, but you know, maybe you should do like this. No, 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 this is my nature, this is how I am. And we do so many wonderful things, but this is my nature, this is how I am. And Hashem is telling us, someone who can hold back her nature, somebody says something to you, offends you, and you don't let anybody walk all over you. You have a comeback right away. You can tell them, excuse me. But you hold yourself back. It says you put your kavod in your pocket. You hide it away. Life is better that way when you do that, Hashem says. It's unbelievable when someone goes against what their nature is. You're a person, you know, you have the, the one type of person who always is out there and, and can answer and can do a million things. And then you have the other type of person that's always relaxed. She doesn't understand. Why does everyone make such a big deal? It doesn't offend me. I'm okay. That person, you know what? She has to go over her nature. Sometimes she has to respond. She has to become confrontational. She has to engage. 
A person has to know what's my nature and how do I use that for my Avodar Hashem? How do I hold back when necessary and how do I go forward when I must? And so, to have this idea of being in Egypt is to teach us experiential faith in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that we That we feel um, exactly what it is that we're supposed to do. The Egyptian God was the sheep. A sheep doesn't think for itself. It does what everyone else is doing. Hashem told the Jewish people, Hashem told each one of us, right now we're right before the ultimate geula, please God. Hashem says there's a sickness in this world. What's the sickness? The sickness is from when already a, a young child will come home with the sickness. What's the sickness? But everyone's doing it. Everyone does this. It must be okay. Everyone is doing it. But everyone is doing, everyone is going, everyone, everyone, everyone. That's the sickness of the sheep. That was the sickness of Mitzrayim. That I do what I do just because everyone is doing it. Hashem says, I want you to slaughter the sheep of Egypt. And I want you to follow and be a sheep just to me. Just to Hashem. Not to everyone. But they're all doing it. No, 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 Hashem says. It's not about doing what everyone is doing. It's about doing what's right. Because Hashem told me to do it. And that is the question that we ask ourselves. I want to do X, Y, Z. What does Hashem feel about it? How am I going to answer to Hashem? Not how am I going to answer to this one? How am I going to answer to my in-laws? How am I going to answer to the this one? How am I going to answer to the that one? No. How am I going to answer to Hashem? What's the right thing to do? And I do it because the Torah tells me to do it. That's what precedes Geula. When I can come out of the, but everyone's doing it, sickness. And that I'm mindful about what I do. So this week's Parsha, we have the first mitzvah that's given to the Jewish people as a nation. The first mitzvah in the world was Peru Uruvu, be fruitful and multiply. But this week's Parsha tells us the first mitzvah that the Jewish people got as our first mitzvah as a nation. What was the mitzvah? We had it today. Ha-chodesh hazeh lachem. Rosh chodesh. So Rosh Chodesh is so nice. We had Tehillim groups. We had nice Su'udas. You know, you do nice things for Rosh Chodesh. It's a very nice mitzvah, Rosh Chodesh. But really, if you had to choose the first mitzvah that Hashem wants to gift to the Jewish people, Rosh Chodesh? Like, it's nice. But Rosh Chodesh, that's like a main mitzvah? Why? Why was the first mitzvah that Hashem gave the Jewish people the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh? So I want to tell you another story. There was a beautiful, wonderful, lovely family. Big family, bunch of kids. And one of their children had learning disabilities. They didn't know. And so for the elementary school years, the, the child was having very, a lot of difficulty in class and the kids, the boys would make fun of him, wasn't really understanding everything as he should and the disability went unaddressed. He's now in 7th, 8th grade and what happens when a child doesn't understand what's going on in class is that that child becomes a behavior problem doesn't get what's going on anyways, and so to protect his ego, he has to pretend like I'm too cool for all of this anyways. And he becomes a behavior problem, the Rebbies are kicking him out, left and right phone calls to the parents. Very difficult to get him into a high school, finally gets into a high school, it's not the right fit. And unfortunately, this boy, his self-esteem is shattered, he's 15 years old, 
And slowly, slowly, the only way he can protect some kind of, but I'm still a person, Hashem Yishmor, he begins to disregard pieces of his Judaism. His kippa goes, his tzitzis goes, he starts listening to non-kosher music, and he, he shifts, his group of friends shift, and his parents, very fine, lovely family, other children in the house, they love this son, but he's, uh, you know, choosing a very, very different path from the path of their family. They're hoping they can, now that, now that they realize what had been going on, it's a little bit late, they're trying to make amends, but things go from bad to worse. His name was Aaron. They tell him, listen, we have this bedroom in the basement. We'll make it only your room. Used to be a few of the kids slept there. It'll be your private space, you know, till you figure things out. But the tension in the house was escalating. He was coming home with more questionable things. Shabbos he wasn't keeping anymore. It was becoming very, very difficult. And it was embarrassing, and his parents and his father and him went head on, come on, sit, learn with me, okay, you know, grow up, and the fighting. And one day, Aaron takes the car without his parents' permission, and he gets into an accident, and his side of the car is smashed up. And he comes home, 15-year-old kid, with already a shattered self-esteem. He comes home and he doesn't know exactly how he's going to approach it. He's gotten himself way deeper than he meant to. And he says to his parents, instead of saying, I messed up the car and I'm so sorry, he says, your car doesn't even have proper wheel alignment. Why is everything in our house broken? And the father lost it. He said, what are you talking about? And they start to get into a fighting match. And the father comes outside to see the damage of the car. And father and son are yelling at each other. And all the neighbors are seeing. And it was just awful. And the father says to the son, I don't understand what she wants from us. Our family is perfect. Our family has everything going for it. Only you, you're the sore part of our family. You ruin everything good that we have. And the boy shrinks into himself. And he says, if that's the case, fine. I don't want to ruin your perfect family anymore. He runs down to the basement, throws a bunch of clothing into a knapsack, and leaves. One day goes by, two days go by, three days go by. The parents are looking, searching, where might he be? They don't know where their son disappeared to. A few weeks later, they hear, oh, we saw your son. He's living on the other side of town. He, he's living with some other kid, uh, you know, not of a high quality. And they're living in this, like, one little studio place that they're renting. He ends up getting kicked out of that. And he writes this story how he goes from place to place trying to figure himself out, but the streets are not an easy place. And he uh, works little odd-end jobs. He lives a life of stealing to get food, to get things that he needs because he doesn't have enough money. And he finds himself at this young age of 15 years old living in a homeless shelter with literally the dregs of society. Nice Jewish kid. And he's in this homeless shelter. Forget Shabbos, forget Kashros. All he could think about is, where am I going to get my next meal? And how am I going to be safe to sleep tonight? That's all this kid is thinking about. And one day he's out trying to get himself a job to do some work for a hire to get a couple of dollars in his pocket. He comes back to his homeless shelter to where his little cubby is and he sees what? Somebody stole all his stuff. The little bit of stuff that he had was not even safe over here. And he's I can't. And he leaves the homeless shelter. He says, I have to figure out what to do. But nothing opens for him. Sleeps on a bench. And he doesn't have food. And he's hungry. He says, one day goes by, two days go by. His clothes stink. He's, he, he's trying to come into a store. Maybe he can steal a bag of chips. But uh, everyone sees one, takes one look at this kid, and they close the door, and they make sure no one lets him in. And three days go by, two and a half days, it's the night, and he feels he's going to die. He has no food. He's been begging. No one's given him any. He, he's so faint, he's going to die. And he says, I did something I never thought I could do. I was so hungry. I jumped into a dumpster. And I started to look to see, is there anything maybe that I can eat? 
He says, I found half a McDonald's hamburger. I quickly opened it up and I shoved it into my mouth till I finally felt like, okay, I could breathe, I'm not gonna die. And then I looked at myself and I said, where am I? I'm, a, I'm in a dumpster. I'm eating this garbage, literally garbage. And he says, I felt this sudden urge. I wanna go home. I just wanna go home. And he says, I jump out of the dumpster and I start walking to where my house was. And it's not a, it's not a short walk. And I'm walking for hours and I keep saying, what are you so, you're so dumb, Aaron. You think they're gonna take you back? What you did, look at you. And he says so many times, I said, I'm, I'm, forget it, I, I have no chance to even go back. But he says, I, I felt so strong, I wanna come back. I just wanted to come back. He says, by three o'clock in the morning, I finally get back to my neighborhood. And I walk to my house. And his house had one of these um, codes to get in, you know, the Shabbos codes. And he says, I'm about to punch in the code. And then I said, oh, Aaron, again, you're so dumb. You don't think they changed the code? Of course they changed the code. Why are you even going to try? He says, but I, I, I pushed myself. And I tried the code. And I was expecting to see a red light. But I saw green. It unlocked for me. They didn't change the code. He says, I walk into my house. I don't know what I'm thinking. They're going to see me. They're going to think I'm an intruder. What's going to be? He says, maybe I'll just sneak down. The entrance to the basement was right at the front. And he says, and as I'm going down, he says, I had a whole bunch of brothers and sisters. The basement was prime real estate. I'm sure there's already going to be like three kids sleeping in my room. Should I go down? Should I not go down? He says, he tippy toes downstairs expecting to be. There's, his room is taken over. He goes downstairs to this basement and he sees... Nothing has been touched. His room, with its posters, with all of the junk that he has hanging up, is exactly how he left it. His bed is perfectly fixed. And on the bed, there's an envelope that says Aaron. He, he can't believe it. He comes, he sees this envelope with his name on it, and he opens up the envelope and he sees it's his parents handwriting and it says in the envelope, it says on the letter, it says, Dear Aaron, we don't know where you are. We don't know what has happened to you. The only thing we know is that if you ever come back here, you're welcome here. If you ever come back, no matter what you've done, no matter what has happened, you are welcome back here as if nothing happened. We just hope and pray that you will come back. Love, Ima and Abba. He reads this. He can't believe it. He's crying. He very quietly showers changes into clothes and he's crying until finally the sun begins to rise and very carefully he doesn't want to scare his mother very carefully he comes upstairs he sees he knows his mom is coming down to start waking up the kids in the whole routine and he's sitting there by the table waiting for his mother to come down she sees him and he doesn't know how she's going to react and she shrieks and she gives him this huge hug and she starts screaming for her husband, come down, everyone calm down, Aaron is home, Aaron is home, Aaron is home. And they hug him and he says, I got your letter, is it true? And mother and father look at each other and they say, if you come home, it's as if nothing happened, just come home. That was the mitzvah that Hashem gave us. Hachodesh hazeh lachem. Chadash. Hashem tells us, I'm giving you a gift of hitchadshut, of renewal, of starting fresh. The greatest, greatest gift that we have as Jews is that Hashem tells us, the moment you decide you want to start fresh again, Hashem says, I'm here, clean slate, clean slate. Nothing happened up until now. Just come home. 
And so we learn Yetziat Mitzrayim. We learn that emuna is not just something that we have to have in our minds, but we have to make it experiential. The next time you feel stressed, I want you to consciously relax your shoulders and say, Hashem is taking care of me. I wonder how this is going to turn to my benefit. Sometimes we see it right away. Sometimes it takes many years. And sometimes we'll only know when we're in the next world. But everything that happens to us is for our benefit. We should live a life of menuchat nefesh of knowing that Hashem is hashkacha pratis. He's watching us specifically, each one of us, individually. That everything that we have is the fruit of a miracle. That we have to overcome the sickness of, but everyone's doing it. And do what we do, because Hashem wants us to. And we can start right now. HaChodesh HaZelachem. To create a fresh start for everything that we've done. Chodesh Tov Umevorach. Shavuot Tov, ladies. All the best.